wanted to welcome you today to the September issue of the Incubate Energy Lab's Lunch and Learn session. Uh, today we're featuring Buzz Solutions and Newfoundland Power. This webcast is being recorded by participating in this call. You can send that your name, voice, and contributions will be included in our recorded materials. Phones and computers have been muted on entry. To unmute yourself, click the microphone at the bottom of your screen, or if you've dialed in, you can press star six. For best connectivity, we suggest uh, logging into the webcast first and having it call you. We would like to have a very interactive chat. You can find chat on the bottom right-hand side of your screen. Feel free to introduce yourself, ask questions, provide comments. Um, make sure to select everyone unless you just want um, to send a question to me and then I can ask that um, on the back side. And I am gonna go ahead and turn it over to Vic with Buzz Solutions and we will get started. Great, uh, thank you, Angie. Uh, it's great, great to be here and uh, showcase our project with EPRI and Newfoundland Power. We had a great experience working with the teams and um, great learning experience, um, as well as um, the capabilities, so the solutions we provided. Uh, we were able to apply that to um, you know other projects as well. Um, so all in all, a positive experience and just wanted to share uh, some of our work, what we are doing, but also some of the uh, learnings and and the work and the solutions we delivered for this project as well. So maybe I can share my screen and, and go through the uh, presentation re really quickly. And then um, I know Dexter has some slides as well. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, make sure that there's some time left as well. So Angie, do you want me to share the screen or do you, do you have it up? I should have it up. Can everybody see it? I can see it, yeah. Okay. Yeah, if you want, you can just go ahead. You should be able to advance the slides on the left-hand side of the screen or at the top of the screen. <laughs> uh, it's the, the arrows are not working on my end when I'm trying to advance. Okay, now it's fine. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we are Bus Solutions. We are uh, providing uh, AI and actionable analytics uh, for grid infrastructure, power line inspections. Uh, before we start off, uh, I want to uh, uh, give some time to uh, Brett Belbin, who's been our um, host uh, utilities uh, prime contact uh, to share his experience working with our technology, our solutions. So Brett, um, over to you. Hi, folks. Can everyone hear me? I, I'm hoping so. Yeah. Yep. Great. Yeah, so thanks, Vic. Uh, sure, I, I can share some experiences. Um, <clears throat> so I'm with Newfoundland Power, and uh, it's a subsidiary of Fortis Incorporated. And we participated in this project to better understand how AI detection and classification of power lines, poles, uh, and equipment can improve the the knowledge of our infrastructure and potentially enhance maintenance decisions. However, to get to this point, we, we needed a large image set uh, to provide to Buzz Solutions. And at the start of this project, uh, Newfoundland Power didn't have any aerial or drone photos of our infrastructure, or many images uh, at all. So we worked with EPRI and a local drone service provider to, to acquire images of about uh, 220 kilometers of distribution infrastructure and uh, 40 transmission structures uh, structures across our uh, operating regions. So this process uh, required the development of operating guides, uh, image capture methodology requirements or, or shot sheets, uh, scheduling, uh, coordinating with various internal and external groups and, and much more. So EPRI's uh, guidance throughout this process was, was really instrumental in, in the project success. And uh, the drone service provider sent Buzz Solutions the images once captured and Buzz ingested them into their AI platform and, and mapped them to the poles. So not only did Buzz's platform classify the infrastructure into asset classes, but it also predicted deficiency levels of our assets. So Newfoundland Power inspectors then verified and modified the, the deficiencies or the deficiency detections throughout the project to improve, uh, improve the platform's prediction accuracy. 
The inspectors also noted updates they wanted to see to Buzz's uh, user interface to enhance their inspection capability uh, while using the platform. But And uh, Buzz Solutions promptly modified its platform to include any of this feedback throughout the project. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this truly created a tailored tailored experience that the inspectors really enjoyed uh, using. So and and finally, uh, Buzz uh, exported a list of the the inspector verified deficiencies, uh, which we uploaded into our asset management platform, uh, Avantis, and that links to our maintenance system. So so overall, this project did require considerable effort uh, from all project stakeholders, but the education and lessons learned throughout the project and guidance from uh, EPRI's principal technical leader, Dexter. Uh, the drone service provider and Buzz Solutions were invaluable, and I encourage you if you have the chance, I I, I really recommend any opportunity to get involved with Epri and the uh, Incubate Energy Labs projects, and uh, that's my experience. So thank you. Thank you, Brett. Really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, uh, going into uh, what we are delivering. Um, to our utility customers is what we're seeing. The problem, as as we all know, is uh, there is a lot of data being captured out in the field uh, around their inspection assets, uh, whether it's transmission distribution, and now we're starting to see substation as well. Uh, but we, we're still seeing that problem where uh, around infrastructure inspections, uh, the whole process is very slow once the data has been captured. Uh, there's still a very manual analysis uh, process or workflow in place that is pretty so slow. Uh, causing months of manual analysis time. Um, we are also seeing there's much more data being captured in the field. So there's not only just visual data points coming from the field, but non-visual data points as well. And, um, you know, we, we're seeing millions of data points coming on an annual basis for utilities. Um, and at that point, the manual analysis becomes unscalable. And because of all these delays and, and slowness in the process, uh, there is high risk and the sector loses $170 billion annually. Uh, due to network failures, uh, blackouts, power outages, force shutdowns, and mass disasters, especially on the West Coast, uh, related to um, uh, uh, component failure, uh, damaged power lines, causing wildfires. And that's where we are coming in with our solution. So our solution is called uh, uh, Power AI, which is a digital uh, software platform, which is powered by our proprietary AI uh, algorithms and models. Uh, so what our whole suite of products does is our platform provides scalable data management um, and secure data management in one place. Also provides a project collaboration capability for inspection teams uh, that have collected data uh, out in the field uh, on their transmission distribution assets. Uh, they can uh, work with uh, one set of data uh, in one single location, which is through our platform. And then beyond that is where our computer vision, machine vision algorithms that are proprietary to us um are 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 used to uh, provide much more automation on the back end uh, to take away the mundane task of shifting through the images um and uh, making sense out of them this is uh, th these kind of algorithms that we have deployed are very cost effective and very uh, and have high accuracy due to the processes or workflows that we have put in place one of them being human in the loop that I'll discuss uh, a little bit more in detail on the next slides uh, but what we have done is we've validated these models with multiple utilities and um, have been uh, seeing uh, pretty high accuracy from, from our models, baseline accuracy of 85% and then going above. Uh, and then another great thing about our models is we want these the results from the AI, uh, from machine learning models to be actionable. So uh, we integrate with work order management systems, uh, GIS systems, asset performance management systems to deliver all these insights back to the utility so that uh, they are actionable and work order plans can be prioritized accordingly. Just to highlight a few examples of our um, AI machine vision, computer vision models. Uh, here's you know various examples where different kind of electrical components um, have been detected using our uh, algorithms, starting from you know dampers, electrical components such as insulators. Uh, various kinds of ins insulators, whether they are polymer, porcelain, glass, different kind of damages on them, um, structural damages as well. So if it's a wooden pole, if there's rot on the cross arm or the pole itself, or, there, or, or if there's cavities on the pole, uh, but if it's a steel structure or a steel pylon, any kind of rust corrosion kind of problems, we detect those as well. 
And then lastly, we also touch upon vegetation management. So a little bit on vegetation encroachment that we can detect from 2D images, which is RGB images captured from drones or so helicopters. And one of the examples is in the top right corner uh, where our models are flagging an instance uh, that has been captured from a helicopter. So a little zoomed out image, uh, but where it's, uh, it's uh, kind of showcasing that there's a there's a line uh, feeder line running and there is an instance where vegetation might be encroaching on it. So it's flagging this as a precaution as well. Then going um, to the, the workflow that we have provided to our uh, utility customers is one of uh, big ones is called human in the loop. Uh, and what it does is once uh, the models or the AI has done its processing, it leverages the subject matter expertise of uh, of utility personnel, whether they're engineers, field technicians, linemen, inspectors that are engaging with our software platform and use their subject, subject matter expertise to um, actually uh, review the predictions and recommendations and suggestions from our AI, and then provide any kind of edits, uh, additions. So if they think that there are certain uh, components that are not captured by our AI, let's uh, they can add those as well and then provide all this feedback on the predictions. And what it does is our system saves all this feedback from subject matter experts, and then we continuously retrain, recalibrate our AI uh, based on all the feedback that has been received. And this was the case with Newfoundland Power. Also, we had uh, around 25 inspectors uh, that on the platform that were providing review um, uh, for for our image for the predictions on the on the images from our AI. And that was being captured and used to retrain the models. Um, we have seen, you know, this kind of tool uh, become really popular with our utility customers because uh, this kind of uh, completes the loop of uh, humans guiding the AI. Even though we start off, uh, you know, with the models that we deploy um, uh, that are already retrained on on thousands of images, uh, but this this kind of workflow also helps in take care of the variability in the data or any kind of new uh, use cases coming in. Um, so provides a, a high degree of personalization uh, for our utility customers. And then lastly, uh, we want the results from the AI to be uh, to be actionable. We want uh, utility personnel uh, to go out in the field and uh, use these inputs as suggestions, recommendations, and prioritize their work order uh, uh, efforts accordingly as well to bring more efficiency into the system. And that's why we integrate our uh, our platform. That's why we integrate our solutions with various kind of uh, systems as well, workflow systems, whether they are work order management systems, IB Maximal, um, SAP, and then as Brett said, uh, Vantis work order management system that Newfoundland Power uses but also GIS, geospatial systems uh, such as Esri's ArcGIS. Uh, we are now also starting to integrate with asset performance management systems also, so delivering all the asset health analysis uh, to these kind of solutions. And how we have done that is uh, by exposing out APIs so we can connect with either APIs or we can ex easily export uh, spreadsheets, um, CSV files, uh, PDF files uh, that are inspection reports or JSON files uh, to these kind of uh, systems. Uh, uh, and that has been pretty successful with, with our customers as well when we have been deploying. One more thing I would add is uh, not only do we expose our uh, integration APIs, we also have um, our AI models exposed as APIs also. So if a um, if a customer or if a partner wants to just use our AI and not use our full suite of software platform, we can easily, you know, expose our AI machine learning machine vision APIs for them as well. And they can call it from their systems um, and leverage the power of our capabilities on the core technology, which is uh, anomaly detection, asset detection uh, capabilities. And that makes us uh, flexible enough to work with at different stages of utilities and at different stages of their use cases. So all in all, uh, again, what we are delivering is a faster approach, saving months of manual analysis time, uh, much more accurate uh, approach with, with our AI capabilities as compared to rest of the players in the market, detecting major transmission distribution assets, anomalies, and faults. Um, being an inexpensive solution, we have seen uh, 
uh, through work with uh, multiple utilities that we are doing in North America, but also uh, in different parts of the world, saving on an average 50% of costs as compared to manual analysis as we are, uh, as more and more data gets added to the inspection workflow of our customers. And then lastly, uh, actionable. We want all these results to go into uh, actions, go into prioritized maintenance plans, and that's why we are integrating with various kind of uh, workflow systems. So to highlight, um, going forward, go, uh, to highlight our project with new phone and power, um, as Brett was mentioning, uh, we had a drone service provider partner um, in the region that went out in the field and collected data and um, worked with Dexter's team as well um, uh, to get uh, relevant guidance on, on the UAV program, flight mapping, drone operations. And uh, they were able to get, go out in the field, collect data and the inspection plan was they would go out in the field for a certain period, collect a uh, volume of data, come back to our platform, batch upload that data, we'll process it, and then the data would be available for Newfoundland Powers inspectors uh, the next day uh, for any kind of review if they, uh, if they require or any kind of prioritization work. So starting off, uh, we did uh, data management in one single uh, location, which was our Power AI platform, but we also did asset tracking, so we were able to uh, cluster uh, all these images to their to their specific structures, whether they were distribution poles or transmission towers, uh, able to track all this imagery, all this data uh, to their uh, exact uh, structures. And that helped with the GIS aspect uh, or asset tracking aspect um, of the project as well. Then after that, we were able to do anomaly detection, which was again, computer vision AI based anomaly detection. Uh, using our proprietary algorithms, detecting any kind of anomaly, starting from structure damages, uh, wooden pole damages, whether there's rot, uh, there's cavities, cracks on the wooden pole, uh, to even insulators, electrical components, transformers, conductors, any kind of damages on those. Uh, so we have a whole list of, of uh, failure modes that we were looking at with our AI. And then using human in the loop workflow, uh, the ex subject matter expertise of uh, inspectors to kind of provide that review and continuously retrain the AI uh, over weeks. And we were able to see an increase in accuracy using the human in the loop work workflow and the subject matter expertise we were able uh, to receive from the inspectors. Um, then going ahead, analytics. So determining asset health analytics and insights, um, tracking that uh, over time and, and keeping track of various kind of um, asset health metrics that we were looking at. And finally, integrating all of those results, all of those insights with uh, work order management system. In this case, it was the Avantis work order management system. So we were uh, regularly able to uh, submit reports generated from our platform uh, in, a, in a manner that was ingestible for the Avantis uh, system to take in and then prioritize the work order efforts accordingly uh, for the work order management teams of new fund and power. Um, just for uh, some of the metrics that we were looking at, again, 5,000 distribution poles were analyzed, uh, around 45,000 images were processed with, with our AI, uh, with our computer vision models. Um, human in the loop workflow was implemented. We had around 25 inspectors, planners, and um, they were using our platform, engaging constantly with our platform to review all this imagery, uh, all the results from the AI. Um, we were able to scalably ingest the data. Um, again, we are a cloud-based platform. Um, we are a web-based application platform as well. So we were able to, we are able to uh, tune up or down on our data needs or the amount of volume of data that's coming. So that's scalable and secure data ingestion and management on our end. Uh, and then uh, we were also able to uh, track um, the the assets itself in the field. We were able to cluster the assets to the exact locations of the poll. So we followed a certain uh, pro uh, schema of data gathering, uh, which we uh, provided to our uh, drone service provider partner on how to capture the data in terms of uh, asset tracking purposes. So one image at the top of the poll, which is the nadir shot, and then uh, multiple images at the oblique, which is capturing the images, uh, capturing the assets in a certain manner. Uh, so we have that guideline as well that they followed and that helped us to track the polls and then the data associated with those polls in a 360 degree manner uh, to, the, to the exact location of those structures. 
Um, just to highlight really quickly um, what, what is next for us. So we are working with uh, a lot of utilities, one, one of them being National Grid US team, working with, again, their distribution transmission teams, uh, providing AI analysis, uh, AI processing for uh, insulators, conductors, wooden poles, structures, any kind of rust analysis. We are also working uh, on, on projects with the National Grid UK team. Uh, we just did a project on their substation, which is a new use case to us, and we have recalibrated, retrained our AI to work with substation data as well. So any kind of analysis on uh, substation insulators, reactors, or transformers, electrical components, but also structures, so concrete footings, uh, any kind of rust corrosion, so determining the health of the structure itself. Here are a few examples where you can see there's cracks and crevices uh, coming up on concrete footing, so analyzing uh, that as well. We also are working with New York Power Authority on uh, transmission on their transmission uh, line inspections, but also have started to see more substation data come to us. So again, similar use case, any kind of electrical component analysis, uh, structural analysis on the substations, but also um, surveilling the substations as well. And then we have also started to look and deploy on the thermal side of things, uh, which is Power AI is using thermal infrared uh, data and then heat signatures patterns to determine uh, whether uh, an electrical component is good or if it's uh, reaching a certain threshold that is not uh, normal and is an anomaly. So putting an alerting system on top of it. So some of the electrical components we started looking at is is conductors, uh, you know, insulators, connectors, and seeing heat signatures and how those are changing uh, over time and uh, monitoring those uh, in a continuous manner. And uh, lastly, also substations, again, where we are deploying uh, our AI uh, on the edge. So this was supposed to be a video. I don't think this uh, might work, but this video over here shows um, uh, basically, um, a frame by frame reference of uh, various components at the at the substation and our AI detecting those components in a video. So this is AI deployment on the edge, which we are doing it for uh, a few utilities right now on their substation sites uh, for surveillance. Another project we ran was with Amron, I mean, major utility in the Midwest. They have a comprehensive drone program. We analyze around 2000 tra transmission structures and continuing to engage uh, with Amron as well on various use, uh, excuse me, various use cases on TND. Just highlighting uh, a little bit on some of the market traction. Again, we're working on a number of projects with utilities and scaling up our operations from uh, POCs, trials, pilots to full scale engagements. We have uh, partnerships in this space as well, strategic partners like power engineers, and then we have partners uh, such as drone service providers and helicopter service provider providers as well. So all in all, what we are delivering to our customers is uh, a lot of automation, saving them mundane manual analysis uh, uh, time and uh, efficiency, but also delivering a um, high degree of cost savings uh, annually as compared to manual analysis, uh, integration with their uh, workflow systems, making their workflow uh, more efficient by these integrations, whether they are work order management systems, GIS systems, asset performance management systems, but also asset tracking. Uh, so not only we are detecting anomalies, we are also detecting good components and tracking them for inventory purposes. And that's um, a little bit about us and some of our projects and our project with Newfoundland Power and Nepri. Um, I'll let Brett, uh, I'll let Dexter take over from here. And thank you so much. Vic, Angie, I'll just pause and defer. Would it be best to um, answer any questions related to Vic's presentation before I go into mine? Um, yeah, well, we can. Um, does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask before we go into Dexter's presentation? If not, in the chat. Then, uh, Dexter, I'll just go ahead and let you, if you want, you can share your screen. I have a question, if I can uh, jump in. Yeah. Okay, go right ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, this is uh, Prost World Water with uh, Clean Energy Ventures. Uh, Vic, thanks for the presentation, that was interesting. Uh, 
I have a question. If you, you could describe a little more how you see utilities uh, integrate this capability into their workflow and like, have the typical timeline, right? From the time the picture is taken, it feeds into your AI system, you process it, it feeds into the utilities workflow. And, I'm, and I realize there's different kinds of pictures, like some drones, some pictures look like they're taken from the ground by maintenance staff, I guess, and maybe different levels of urgency and if there's how the prioritization might work. I don't I, I wonder if you could bring that to life a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you. That's a great question. So usually when we are deploying with utilities, uh, again, yes, we are getting a lot of, you know, different kind of data. We not only on just you know drone or helicopter imagery or we've seen you know at substation we have seen people walking on the substation side with dslr cameras uh, clicking images we're getting that data as well we're getting thermal data so different kinds of data but when when we when we are uh, <clears throat> engaging with our utility customers we usually uh you know try to work with them in terms of uh, running uh, a, a pilot first uh, showcasing our capabilities um, and then during that time frame of pilot, and that could be from one month to three months, if you've seen some pilots be six months. But during that time frame, we integrate with their uh, systems um, as well. So we work with their teams and their teams get, you know, uh, familiarized with our software capabilities. Uh, we, we train them on how to use it, but we also integrate with their uh, systems, whether there's uh, whether they're using cloud storage systems uh aws uh, microsoft azure or gcp we, we can work with any of those so we can integrate with their data warehouses bring that data to our uh, to our platform for them to you know visualize engage uh, visually with that process it and then we can showcase all those results back on our platform and then uh, they can also go back to their systems so we have a few options when we are engaging with utilities uh, beyond the pilot is uh, during the pilot time frame we work we understand their use cases we understand their data compliance uh, privacy issues as well and work with them so if they are willing to you know house the data on our side we provide that as an option so they can use our storage systems to house it uh, the second option is if they want to uh, they if they want uh, to keep the data on their side we can work with that as well and that's why we have apis uh, so the apis will fetch the data process it and send it back to their systems and the third option is we have also we can also deploy within their systems. So again, these APIs can be deployed on um, either their cloud systems or data warehouses, uh, or even their <clears throat> applications that they're using within their firewalls. So we've done that with a couple of utilities now doing that uh, going forward as well. So we have a few options and we are flexible to work with utilities. And then we basically on, re re repeat this uh, this kind of process. Right. Got it. So, but but it, w when in production, right? So the typical processes you'd support would these be sort of uh, maintenance planning type processes over a number of weeks or months, or would there be some, you know, intraday uh, emergency issues, diagnosis and stuff like that? Or I'm trying to get a range for the the typical turn, you know, use and turnaround time for this uh, your tool. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, so it's it's a mix of uh, all of those. Uh, so basically, uh, finding out anomalies with our AI, but also helping uh, utility teams prioritize these. Uh, you know, based on the asset health uh, from prediction from our AI, they can prioritize. So we have capabilities on our platform that they can you know select a priority level of maintenance required, whether it's like an emergency situation versus priority five or six. That means that we look at it in six months. Uh, so those kind of things, and when they are exporting out or integrating all these results to their work order system, so they, they that has all that metadata associated with it uh, that they generated or they prioritized. Uh, so right now, utility what a utility uh, user would do is they would go into our platform. Our AI has already done the job of detecting any kind of anomalies. They'll provide their manual prioritization uh, kind of feedback over there. So let's say they put emergency. Uh, so continuously, our AI systems are also tracking it and then learning from it. But basically, um, they can provide their input over there that, OK, this structure is severely damaged, create an emergency priority on the, on its maintenance plan, and then export it out so that that can go to their work order system. Got it. OK, thank you.
And yeah, I, I see there's one more question in the chat. Uh, I can answer that. So uh, yeah. the question is, now that the project is complete, how does repeatability look? What would a typical turnaround time be for a new round of data collection and analysis? What is the expected frequency of this kind of inspection? So uh, we have made the system more repeatable. And after uh, EPRI and New Found in Pro uh, Powers project, uh, we are replicating this whole process for other utilities as well. One of them, major ones being New, uh, New York Power Authority, which we are working with. Um, so we are repeating this process. They are setting up their own in-house drone program, uh, but we are the AI and software uh, analysis engine uh, for them. So basically working with their data uh, also. Again, in terms of our AI models, they are already uh, retrained. They are already trained on tens of thousands of training data sets. Uh, what we do is we expose them, we run those uh, as initial uh, kind of processes and, and showcase the, uh, the accuracy and the efficiency of those models to our, to our host utility customers uh, so that they can see what are the baseline accuracy metrics and where it needs to improve. And that's when we bring in the human in the loop kind of workflow. So in terms of uh, new round of data collection uh, and analysis, we can work with newer data as well, um, You know whether it's captured from drones, helicopters, fixing aircraft, uh, and then work uh, build on top of it. And then in terms of uh, repeatability, we are deploying this for multiple customers and then following the same pattern that we did um, over here on this project and um, basically building that and then expanding multiple uh, you know, like expansion opportunities as well, one of them being substations. So we're starting to do a little bit more on substations as I was showcasing for New York Power Authority, but basically following the same plan of this uh, you know, data collection, data, inject, data acquisition, data ingestion into our system, uh, data analysis, processing, human in the loop workflow, uh, analytics, exporting our results, reviewing the results from, from the utility subject matter experts, and then integrating those with, uh, with the workflow systems that the utilities are using. Well, Vic, I'm going to take over. I see that the thank you came in from the question. So thank you all for letting me spend some time talking to you on this Lunch and Learn. I was the project manager involved with the Incubated Energy Project in 2021, the Buzz and the Newfoundland Power. I'm an uh, electrical engineer by formal education, but I've spent the majority of my research focused the last five, six years in the overhead inspection space specifically looking at the use of drones and other data collection tools and technologies, uh, looking for solutions to try to automate that inspection process to um, really improve the efficiency of over traditional methods. Uh, along the way, I think there's quality benefits and the type of inspections that can be done, as well as safety benefits by using machines instead of humans in some of these areas. So uh, in this demonstration we had with Buzz, we sent them into the distribution environment, which in itself is a fairly messy, noisy, complex environment where really we don't even have a traditional method of aerial inspections to compare against, you know, to baseline the drone against the, the way it's always been done. It's always been done from the ground. So there was a, a ton of learnings that came out of that effort alone and then um, looking at ways to manage that information. Um, exposed some some maybe some gaps in the industry um, but also just got me thinking about maybe some trends and considerations for a drone image or data management tool i like to think about imagery but video is certainly a useful use case as well so this presentation is focused on the distribution environment um, but a lot of these lessons learned hold true to uh, substations or transmission and what we tried to do in this project was perform comprehensive inspections uh, of distribution structures. And when we say comprehensive, we mean we're kind of looking at every component, uh, making sure that each of the components are healthy, you know, and that there's nothing visually inferable that would indicate some type of degradation in performance or that it's going to fail soon. Now, in <laughs> in all honesty, these, these inspections are actually pretty difficult, uh, pretty complex. There's a lot of components of interest, and then there's a ton of failure modes. And wanting to automate this via AI is a pretty um, hard task. 
in all honesty, um, considering just the amount of variability we have. So when you look, when you get an image like this, kind of the typical process a human would do would be kind of starting at the top and working their way down, looking at, again, you know, this sensor, for example, is there any discolorization at the bottom that would be indication of a smoke or an arcing discharge? Are the electrical connections in place? Um, then moving on to the arresters, are they failed? Do they have their wildlife guards? You know, these things that when you, you know, if you're kind of trained in the space, they really jump out to you if they're not there, like this uh, wildlife guard, not on this arrestor here. But um, for a machine to do it, it's actually pretty complicated. And in, in, in all fairness, it's, it's complicated for a human to do it. And when you talk to inspectors that are performing these comprehensive inspections, they typically tell me, you know, they always want more, um, more resolution, more perspectives of the same thing, more frequent data, you know, so that the data is only as good as the, uh, you know, the date that it was taken and it immediately starts, starts losing value over time. You don't really don't know what's changed. And then just more usable data, understanding that sometimes you're exposed to lighting conditions and blur and focus. And, um, more can actually be overwhelming to traditional data management approaches. Um, so solutions like Buzz, you know, trying to build new age, next generation approaches is really something utilities should continue to invest in and look at. Now, this becomes even more of a problem when you begin to automate the data collection. So we've been doing a lot of, uh, you know, auto flights, if you would. You, you kind of tell the drone where to go a little bit, but then allow it to make its own decisions for capturing imagery. And you get these kind of blanket image capture approaches. So for one asset, for example, uh, I think with the Newfoundland Power, we had a maximum of five images we would ask the human to take. You know, one straight down and then four kind of quadrant images. But when you automate it again and you remove that human from the decision process, because there's not any onboard decision making on these drones in regards to meeting like a shot sheet, uh, they sometimes just blanket the structure with imagery. So again, 93 photos is what this turned out to be in this automated inspection. This is a, a quick video of those, but one thing that stands out is just the, uh, yeah, the clarity that you get. And this is a 12 megapixel camera, which is actually pretty low uh, on the drone technology spectrum they have 100 megapixel cameras out now but um just the again the coverage that you get of looking at the structure from all different perspectives is really great and if you show it to an inspector they're going to want it so as utility solutions we got to figure out really what's the best way to present that data to them and have them uh, some type of efficient workflow to extract information Vic called it actionable information in his slide, and it applies here. It's, you got to turn this raw data into usable information to, for it to have value. So with our project team, we kind of brainstormed one call, what would be uh, you know, the nice to haves for a inspection data solution. Uh, we kind of went through the workflow, thinking about from a data ingest perspective, after it's been collected, how do we get it where it needs to go? And <laughs> I think in most of these cases, you could imagine us really just wanting to wave a magic wand and say, in data ingest, you plug in your SD card, you move it here, and then it's easy. It just is cataloged automatically with the metadata. You've got these other processes that could identify, again, maybe some blurry images and filter those and flag them. Um, and specifically and importantly, it can be related to some type of existing utility record. So the, the terminology here is called conflation, but it's the tying and merging of two uh, data sets. So you want your imagery merged to basically your asset record so that you can uh, have a living, you know, any any kind of inspection that criteria you come up with can be associated to that record and not the image. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on these. These are available on the uh, PowerPoint, but you can kind of look at them um, in terms of, of what we're thinking. So EPRI, we're, we're not so much building these solutions ourselves as much as we're trying to, uh, you know, advance the industry to build better solutions and even utilities themselves. So if you're interested in this topic, we have some imagery that's available from some of these automated inspections that contain the geospatial information. 
So uh, the imagery that we got from the Newfoundland power inspection, we actually labeled that and shared that as well. But as a part of protecting um, yeah, and just uh, anonymization, we actually removed all the geospatial information in those images, but we kept it within this data set. So that's just FYI, that's out there for you. These are those uh, Newfoundland power images um, and the labels that we applied to them and some of the class distributions there. It took us a um, little, little less than 1,100 hours to do this. It was some guidance that uh, Pratik, that EPRI created, and um, then we brought in an external workforce that would kind of use that guidance and follow it, almost like an instruction guide of how to label these classes. And again, this is uh, free and available to you if you'd like to uh, use it. So what I see is really the current gap that we have is this, again, coming back to this topic of conflation of when we get imagery, we kind of want to manage it geospatially because that's how we're accustomed to managing our assets already is having some type of geospatial layer to look at. Um, and what we want to do is, again, tie those images, like, images automatically to that um, geospatial asset, that pole asset. And in the best case scenario, this can work okay. Uh, Vic and the team talked about how we would have a shot cadence that would always start with the camera pointed straight down over the top of the pole in order to give us a basically a reference GPS coordinate. And then we would pull from a two-dimensional radius uh, images that were close to that uh, reference point and then assign those to whichever GIS feature is closest to that reference. And that works um, a lot of times, but it does not work every time, especially when you begin to have some of these poles that are really close to one another. So more in the distribution space, as well as when you have transmission assets that may be in the same right of way or overbuild and underbuild, it can get kind of messy when you try to just use it, just do a 2D uh, image to pole conflation exercise. Now, if you recognize though, the drones are pretty sophisticated and they actually embed quite a lot of metadata within these imagery. You can uh, come up with a view shed analysis of where that, you know, kind of image is looking. And you can also get it in a three dimensional domain. So every time a drone captures an image, at least in, in most drones, it will give you a X, Y, and Z position, as well as a pitch, roll, and yoll and heading of where that camera is looking. So Again, going back to this conflation challenge that we have when assets are really close to one another, if you can leverage this view shed or this kind of where is the camera looking intelligence, you could probably uh, handle those crowded scenarios a little bit better. Um, and additionally, uh, oops. Additionally, you can uh, bring in additional information from the from the drone itself. I saw this uh, the other day on uh, Reddit, believe it or not. I thought it was pretty cool, uh, so I thought I'd show it. But what they were doing is taking a drone, uh, capturing image stills along the path with the drone camera pointed straight down. And because it's straight down, it's a little bit easier to do a lat long kind of X, Y mapping. And they embedded a uh, solar panel object detection workflow to try to pick out which of those pixels corresponded to roofs that had solar panels on it, and then predict those again in a you know kind of X Y lat long perspective. Gets a little more challenging when you have oblique data, oblique imagery, where you do have slightly off the Z axis kind of angle that you're looking at. But this is where I think maybe you could begin to bring in some AI workflows. So I'm I'm not necessarily saying that this model that you're seeing here is solving everything from an automated inspection perspective, because I've already told you how many issues and components there are of interest there. But if you could leverage just your object detection, you know, pole class model and also leverage all of this other data that you have from the data, you know, from the image once it's captured your location, your field of view, pitch roll, yo, all that stuff, you could probably do some pretty accurate predictions of where that pole is in three-dimensional space and improve your GIS conflation uh, task. And that's a very technical topic and uh, probably deeper than y'all wanted to go, but that is kind of the, the biggest gap I see right now is just taking your field collecting data 
and tying it to your UI, your GIS assets and doing it in an automated manner. Now, <clears throat> some additional considerations for like what I would consider the next generation, you know, inspection tools is given utilities uh, and inspectors some ways to actually like interact with the data themselves um, in order to keep their kind of three-dimensional situational awareness of where they are and where the images were captured so that if they wanted to see one side of the pole or one side of the asset, they have some way to quickly maneuver through those images. And I think it's got to be, in, in this case, like a three-dimensional layer because it does get difficult if you have these this many images all stacked up on one another on a two-dimensional layer. You can't really tell which images were captured above versus below one another. Another kind of feature I thought would be nice is if you, uh, excuse me, if you did get some video that came in from, uh, you know, your, your inspection. I think about football coaches, uh, sports coaches, you know, watching tape, you always see them rewind and fast and slow motion. And kind of, it'd be nice to have some type of feature that's linked in if you have these data to manage it geospatially and also recall it, but manipulate it in this way. So here I was just looking at that antenna moving back and forth. And that kind of opens the door for other tools to improve the usefulness of the data that you get. And Again, if this is all within one inspection, you know, software package, that's nice. But if nothing else, you just need to be able to you know, interact with whatever these software packages are in a fluid, easy manner. So you you see an asset in your GIS and you recognize all the data that's tied to it and you pick which systems you want to open to interact with it. But this I was looking at the video stabilization there. And the last thing I have is, uh, Again, just ways to turn the data into more useful data. And some of these could be automated. Some of them could be human generated where they physically manipulate some of these contrast values. Uh, another use of AI, kind of off, you know, the general main topic, but it's this idea of uh, uh, sharpening and improving the uh, resolution of some of the data. So this is a tool called Gigapixel AI, and they make your imagery about six times more uh, the spatial resolution. And that could mask some defects. I really don't know, but we just, again, just kind of playing around with it on the uh, original image on the left of the frame versus the enhancement on the right. So if any of this is, is interesting to you as utilities, uh, this is work that we do in this advanced distribution inspection project. The motivation is to automate the inspection provide the most value and impact from safety, quality, speed, and cost. And it's uh, we've been doing a lot of work on automated data collection and then this automated data interpretation. So again, if it's of interest to you, um, you can scan the QR code there, get some more information, or just reach out to me and I'll be happy to talk to you about the project. So I think that leaves us maybe nine or 10 minutes. I can take any questions or really for the whole uh, pre present, both presentations you saw today. I put Dexter's email in the chat if anybody needs that. Um, does anybody have any questions? If not, we can give you a few minutes back in your day. <clears throat> um, we will have this recording posted to the Incubate Energy Labs website. Um, it'll probably be the middle of next week before that happens. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me at any time. Uh, Angie Henniger or a Henniger at every.com. <laughs> I'll put that in um, the chat as well. I do have, um, could you provide a big picture overview for the next round of the Incubate Energy? Anybody got that? I know that we do have our demo. I do. We do have our demo days um, in October, and I know we're going to do a planning day after demo days. If anybody needs an uh, invitation to that, please just send me an email real quick. And then Dexter, I'm sorry I interrupted you. You can go ahead. <clears throat> I, I was going to just toss it back, toss that one back over to you, Angie. I didn't think I had a 
good answer to that one. 